Good morning. I think I might be on mute. Give it a second. Very good. Oh. oh, there we go. All right. Good morning. I'm Pastor Tiffania, pastor here at Seminole Heights United Methodist Church. I'm so glad you're joining us for worship in person and online this morning. Uh, we had some technical difficulties uh, getting online, but we are here. Uh, hopefully you're able to enjoy our live stream if you're watching with us uh, online. Uh, and we appreciate everyone's understanding and patience as we're getting used to figuring out uh, new technology and what that means for us in worship. Uh, now I invite you to join with us in our call to worship led by our Family Ministries Director, Brad. What do you bring before the Lord this day? What do you seek? We seek peace for our future souls. You will find it in this place, for this is the house of the Lord. Open our hearts and our spirits, O Lord, to hear the words of comfort and peace.
we're going to move into a time of prayer. And uh, just a reminder that we have prayer cards in person if you're here worshiping with us. Um, there should be some in the back of your seats. They're also in the back of the sanctuary. And there is a link right there in the live stream video where you can let us know how we can be in prayer with and for you together. Um, I have uh, an update to share. Sue Blankenship is doing well. Um, she's expected to go home soon after her uh, surgery last week. So thank you. Uh, definitely, she's appreciated the prayers and um, calls are welcome. Uh, and then I have some hard news. Um, if you're on our prayer email, you uh, probably already saw this, but um, Betty Jones passed away unexpectedly um, on Thursday. Uh, she was our church secretary for over 37 years um, and grew up in this church and um, had like been it was a member of our choir. Um, so uh, it's a tough loss for our church and for our community uh, that Betty's passed away. Um, we are planning to have a service here at the church, a celebration of her life on November 20th. Um, so if you uh, want to join us, all will be welcome uh, to join us here in the sanctuary for that. Um, it's, it's a hard loss, uh, as I said, and uh, we know Betty will be dearly, dearly missed by this church community. Um, so now we're going to move into prayer, and I invite you as we pray to please keep the Jones family in your prayers uh, and to keep our church in prayer uh, as we grieve this loss together. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you to worship as your people, as people who aren't sure whose we are sometimes, but God, we know that you you are always there for us. God, when we don't have the words, when we don't have the even the strength, we know that you are with us, that you are giving us strength each and every day. God, I especially want to pray for all those who have lost loved ones recently, and especially for the Jones family. God, that they will know your peace and your comfort, that you will dry their tears and remind them of your hope. God, we pray for our church, for our community, for our neighborhood, for our world, with so much unrest and uncertainty still. God, we pray that we can be people of your peace, of your love that we will share love and not hate, and that we will be instruments of your will in the world. And we pray this as your people together. Amen. Now, um, I'll go ahead and do the children's sermon debating uh we don't have children with us in person but we often will have children watching online so uh i'm going to share a message just for them um i think i'll stay up here just for ease for everyone uh so today uh we're going to be talking about generosity and uh we heard in our opening song take my life and that is really our message for today and I've talked about generosity with you all before. Generosity means giving with a good attitude. It's not just giving, but really it's about our hearts when we give. Now, to help us to understand generosity, one of my favorite books about this topic is called The Giving Tree. And um, many of you may have read it. Uh, some of our kids watching may have even read it. And in The Giving Tree, it tells a story about a young boy and his favorite tree. And the boy would gather the tree's leaves and eat its apples and swing from its branches and fall asleep under its shade. And the book says the boy loved the tree and the tree was happy. But as the boy got older, 
he struggled to make time to spend with the tree. And when he did visit the tree, he just asked for things from the tree. He just took what he could. So when the boy asked, the tree was always happy to give. So the boy wanted money. The tree gave him apples to sell in the market. The boy wanted a house to stay warm, so the tree gave him its branches to build a home. The boy wanted to escape from everything as he got older, so the tree let him chop down its trunk to build a boat to sail away. And through all this, the tree gladly and freely gave of itself to make the boy happy and to provide for his well-being. And in the final pages of The Giving Tree, the boy, who is now an old man, returns to the tree one last time. And the tree tells him that it doesn't have anything left to offer. But he doesn't need anything. He says he just would like a quiet place to sit for a while because he's very tired. And the tree, who is just a stump at this point, offers the boy, now a man, a place to sit and rest. The boy slowly walks towards the stump, takes a seat, and the tree was happy. Now, this idea, this example of the giving tree, is an extreme one. The tree gave all it had, all its being to this boy. And in the tree's giving, we can see generosity. It always gave with a willing attitude. It gave all it had. It had apples, branches, and even its trunk to the boy. Now, this isn't for us to literally, physically give all that we have to others. It's actually a helpful reminder of how God gives to us. God takes care of us. No matter what we need, God is always there for us. And so it's our job to let God take care of us and to help us be generous toward others. So there's a lot of ways that we can do that in our lives, thinking of others first, being free in our giving of what we can and what we have. And for this week, I try to always give our, in our children's sermon a little challenge. I would encourage kids and adults to think of one way that you can be generous this week. Let us pray together. Generous God, we give you thanks for your many blessings. Give me the opportunity to be generous to others in my life. Amen. Now that said, we're going to be moving into our time of giving uh, this morning, our, we call our offering time. And this is a chance for us to give back to God out of all that God has given to us. It's a chance for you to be a part of our church's ministries. Uh, we've been sharing several ways that we can give back this holiday season. Um, I showed you last week, I still have it up here. My Publix bag of Metropolitan Ministry donations. Um, it cost me about $25 to purchase everything for a family of four. Um, so if you're able to purchase even just a couple of extra items uh, through this holiday season, it will really make a difference to someone in need during this time. Uh, we also have an opportunity for you to adopt a family um, this is something we started several years ago with our partner schools. Uh, if you sign up, you can let us know what size family you think we could help. Uh, and you're asked to purchase Christmas gifts for the family, uh, for their kids, and um, a gift card for uh, them to buy a holiday meal. And that goes directly to the school social workers in our partner schools, and they make sure that the families get them. Uh, we have to have the sign-ups early so that we can get everything distributed. So um, you can sign up this whole week. Uh, next Sunday, our sign-ups will close. But uh, I definitely want to encourage you to consider uh, how you can give back during this holiday season and 
If you feel like you can't give back, that's okay. Uh, there's, we all give together, we share together. Uh, so it's not just about what one person can do, but what we all can do when we come together. Um, so if you want to make a gift to be part of our ministry, you can do that uh, through, if you're here in person, we have envelopes, uh, giving envelopes for you. Uh, you can also make a gift online. You can text the word SEM Heights to the number 40101, and that will send you a link to give. There's also a QR code on the screen, uh, so you can just take a picture of that. That will also send you a link to give. So there's a lot of ways that you can give and be a part of our ministries and be a part of what we're doing here in Seminole Heights. Uh, so now uh, we will move into a time of reflecting and a chance to give back, and uh, we'll have Judy play an offering song for us. As we talk, he said, Beware of the strider who likes to walk around the long road and be greeted with respect in the marketplace. And there are the best seats in the synagogue with thick wood of honor and guard. They devour our widows' houses, and the sake of the parents say long prayer, they will receive the greater commendation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came up and put in two small, small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Sir, they have told you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she has, all she has out of them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, I've been telling you this, and it's true. I'm not picking these scriptures. <laughs> the scripture for today, I am picking them, but the scripture for today comes from the lectionary. This tool to help pastors preach through an entire book of the gospel in a year. And so we are coming to the end 
of this preaching season in the book of Mark. So um, this text for today, I know I've been preaching and talking a lot about generosity and giving, but this is the text that we've been given. So uh, I think God's trying to tell us something today. Now, even if you have never heard this Bible story before, you've heard this Bible story before, right? The concept of the widow's might is used often as a shorthand for when someone gives all they have left, especially when it's not much. And in this version, we hear Jesus praising the widow's gift. Everything she had, all she had to live on. What? Is that really the message we're supposed to take away from this? I don't know about you, but I have bills to pay, right? I can't literally give everything I have in the offering plate, even if I wanted to. So does this mean that this teaching of Jesus just doesn't apply? We just don't have to talk about it. We want to just talk it up to one of those metaphors, right? Something nice. Maybe there's another takeaway from these verses. If we look at the first section, it helps us to maybe understand a little bit more about the widow and her gift. So in the first section we read, Jesus tells us, beware the scribes, devouring the widow's houses. And then later, Jesus says, the widow has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So we've got a clear contrast here and some redefining of the rules that define society in Jesus' day and still define us today. The scribes, the shorthand for wealthy people, they lived for self, wanting and hoarding, grabbing hold of everything they could get their hands on, regardless of the damage they caused. Kind of sounds a little bit like our modern day economy, doesn't it? They took from the most vulnerable in society without regard for their well being. In contrast, the poor widow gave away. She lived for others, not for herself, regardless of the damage she would cause to herself. She, the most vulnerable in society, gave without regard for her own well-being. Now, some of us would probably call it but Jesus called it faith. You see, it's important to recognize that the widow's gift of all she has is a gift of trust. It means that she trusts in the care that is being offered by the very institution that she gave her whole living to. One of the most important commands in the law gets repeated over and over again is to care for widows. Widows, orphans, and foreigners are, are mentioned together as the most vulnerable in society in the Bible. So perhaps the widow gives so much because she is grateful for what she received from the temple. The widow's action is a sign of faith in the community. She doesn't worry about herself because there are others who know how to look after those in need. She trusts in the temple and those who administer its grace. So the widow's might isn't just a story about generosity or an extreme example of giving. It's an example for all of us of what it means to live by faith, putting our money where our mouth is, supporting those who care for others, and giving in a meaningful way, not just out of our extra or excess, because 
It says the widow wasn't the only one who gave that day. Many others gave, and they gave much more than the widow. So what about them? Jesus saw them, and he doesn't say their gifts are bad or wrong, but they just don't mean as much to them. The larger gifts aren't gifts of faith because they're given out of excess. They're given out of the extra. How did Jesus know this? How did anyone know how much anyone else was giving? It doesn't say Jesus was looking, you know, over their shoulder. It says he was across the court from the treasury. This isn't where, a case where Jesus had mind-reading abilities. The treasury that is mentioned here wasn't a separate room or building. The, they are large offering boxes. And these weren't just, you know, the offering plates that we have that um, are hidden away and brought out during worship to be passed discreetly or, you know, left on the side for people to slip in their gifts. No, these boxes sat out in the public courts as a way for all to have access to give. Even if they weren't worthy of going into the inner courts of the temple. Remember, you had to be considered righteous. You had to be ritually clean and holy in order to enter the inner courts. So these offering boxes gave access to everyone to give. And it was really easy to see who was giving. The other thing to know is these boxes were actually very loud. They were not the cushioned plates that we have. It was really easy to hear how much everyone was giving. These were large metal trumpet-like receptacles. The opening actually looked like a trumpet, so you could pour in your temple money and it would cause a really loud clinking and clanking so everyone would hear how much you gave. No doubt, some would even aim their donations to make the loudest sound possible, hoping to wow all the bystanders with their wealth and their supposed generosity. But Jesus ignores all the noisemakers and draws attention to the faint of tiny copper coins dropping into the box. And he says, this widow has put in more than all the other clinkers and clankers in the courtyard. Now, we do the math here, it's not too hard. Even at a rough estimate, this woman contributed a minuscule amount, two copper coins, I mean, equivalent to our pennies, a minuscule amount compared to what many of the others probably gave that way. So why does Jesus say she gave more? Jesus tells us, makes it very clear, the others put in what they weren't going to use anyway. They put in their excess, their leftovers, the interest on the interest. She put in her whole life. The translation we read says she put in her whole living. The word used for living here is bios. Literally, this word means life. It's where we get the word biology, the study of life. She put in her whole life. Now, we've been talking in this season, the last several weeks, about generosity with our possessions, with our money, with our stuff. And there's another teaching here. We are to give of our lives to. Yes, we are to give of what we have, and we're to give of our lives. Our life is a gift, the gift from God. It's not something for us to hoard, but something to be given away as a blessing, as an act of gratitude in service. Friends, we are called and we are invited even set free from our bondage to self and to our stuff, to live free and unencumbered by our own lives, to embrace 
the constant hope of eternity. Last week, we talked about Jesus as the resurrection and the life. We can live now in the promise of new life, unafraid of death, and we can live forever with God through the power of the resurrection. Jesus is always inviting us to deeper relationship with God. Jesus is always calling to us, and Jesus is always teaching us if we listen. And how we spend our money is one clear indication of where our priorities lie. Now, I am not telling you to choose between buying groceries and giving of your finances to the church or to other causes. Because Jesus told us today, it's not about the amount that we give. That's not the most important thing. The poor widow gave two copper coins and she gave more in Jesus' eyes than any of the wealthy people that day. The most important thing is that we give to God out of all we have, not just out of our excess. We're called and invited to give out of our first fruits, out of our best to God. Now that's gonna look different for everyone. I can't tell you what your best giving looks like. I don't know your financial situation. I don't know how much time you spend at work or with your family or in other areas of your life. But I do know that today Jesus is calling us to make a change, to live differently than the world around us. We're not called to have status, to have lots of money, to look good. We are called to share what we have, to give of our time, and ultimately of ourselves to the work of God. One simple way to start is to start by making a commitment to give to the church for the next year. Now, if you have never made a giving commitment before, just I invite you to start looking at what you currently give, what you currently give to the church, what you give to other causes. The amount doesn't matter, but what matters is that it's meaningful to you. 10% is a number that we share as a guide. It's a number that is given to us in the Old Testament as our goal for giving, but it's not a requirement. If you can't even think about giving 10% of your income to the church or elsewhere, that's okay. Just start somewhere. If you already give 10%, Maybe consider how you can stretch yourself a bit more, give in other areas or in other ways of your life. The widow's might was just two copper coins. It was all she had. And Jesus said it was worth more than all the other large gifts. The amount we give doesn't matter. Giving is one way that we can live out our faith in God. Instead of just having faith in ourselves and our money, we're invited to put our trust in God. Now, we started uh, last week with talking about making a giving commitment. So if you have already made that commitment, I thank you. And I want you to know Jesus sees your gift, just like he saw the widow's gift. If you haven't made a giving commitment, I want to invite you, if you're with us in person, we have yellow cards in the back of the sanctuary. We also have, uh, you can go online to our website, semheights.com slash pledge. Uh, there's a link, uh, actually I don't think there is a link in the video today, but uh, it's there on our social media pages. And I just invite you to pray about it first, just to pray and see what God says to you, where God is leading you to give of yourself this year. We're invited on the commitment card to offer our prayer, our gifts, our talents, and of our finances to God in the coming year. So you're invited to see how you can grow your faith 
through giving and generosity. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we're going to move into a time of communion. And Jesus, it's no coincidence that the widow's might uh, encounter takes place in Jerusalem just a few days before Jesus was killed. Because Jesus doesn't ask us to give what he did not already give for us, his very life. All are invited to receive communion. You don't have to be a part of this church or any church. You just have to love God and seek to grow in your faith and live in peace with God and with each other. Therefore, we are invited now to confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God. Are we there? Okay. Merciful God. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In your name, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. You're now invited to share peace with one another where you are seated, and if you're joining us online, we invite you to share peace with us right there in the chat. So the peace of Christ be with you all. We now move into a time to give thanks to God. So let us lift up our hearts and give thanks. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. By your appointment, the seasons come and go. You bring forth bread from the earth and create the fruit of the body. You formed us in your image and made us stewards of your world. Earth has yielded its treasure. And from your hand, we have received blessing on blessing. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for our sake he became poor. When hungry and tempted, he refused to make bread for himself, that he might be the bread of life for others. When the multitudes were hungry, he fed them. He broke bread with the outcast, but drove the greedy from the temple. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And we remember a night in which Jesus was given up for us. He was with his friends in an upper room, and he took the bread and chain crowd on the table. He gave thanks to God. He blessed it. He broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of the meal, he took the cup which they had been sharing. He gave thanks to God and blessed it and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. 
And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. And God, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by the blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, we are invited to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. 